verse 8. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 8. And as soon as I get there, I will read it for you. Give me a second. All right, Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 8. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking to your word this morning and studying it together. And as we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ, be edifying to the saints, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Um, we've been looking at you know our four pillars of truth, and we've been spending a little extra time um, this year going through them. We always do that at the beginning of the year. We're doing a little extra time this year. I, I'm, I'm taking myself down a road that I didn't want to go down because uh, we're talking about a book you can trust. So we want to talk a little bit about you know our King James Bible, how we got that King James Bible. It's very hard to know where to draw the line. You can do an extraordinarily deep dive into the King James Bible and, and it's, it's um, accuracy and how we got it. Um, if you were here for the first service, Keith played a video of a guy that obviously has dived very deeply into you know comparing the King James Bible and, and seeing why it is it, it is um, superior to the others with with numbers of mentions of names and that sort of thing. Um, and so you can certainly go that way and people spend their whole career doing that. I haven't done that and um, we're not going to do that this morning, but we are going to try this morning just to give you a little bit of an idea as soon as I find a marker here, a little bit of an idea uh, of of where the King James Bible comes from, where the, the different versions come from today, um, and, and how we got to where we are with literally hundreds, maybe thousands of different versions of the Bible. Um, this verse, Isaiah chapter 30, tells us that God's plan is to write His Word in a table and note it in a book, and that in doing that, He's going to preserve it. We looked at the three, the three processes that God uses to get His Word. There's revelation. He reveals His truth in man's ears. There's inspiration. He takes that revealed truth and writes it down on a page. And there's preservation. He preserves those words through the ears so that we today can know that we possess the Word of God. And this morning we're going to look at a very, very abbreviated and, and uh, summarized history of, of the, where the Bible, how we got the Bible that we have today. And why is it that we use the King James Bible as the authoritative Word of God as opposed to all the other translations? Or why don't we just say, whatever one speaks to you? That's what most people do. Whatever one speaks to you, that's the one you should use. Well, whatever speaks to you doesn't necessarily mean it's the Word of God. Um, so we need to understand where the Word of God is. So I'm going to write a couple things on the board, which will look uh, perilously close to a chart. But it's not a chart. Um, <laughs> As, as Keith said, you can make a timeline that is not a chart. So we're going to try to do a little bit of a timeline this morning. Um, and let's, let's start. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. <coughs> I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, understand a couple of things as we get started this morning. And a, a lot of this morning is going to be just talking about history. And that's really kind of Keith's specialty. But, um, you know, he, he bowed out on that this morning. So I'm going to have to give you some history. Uh, just so we can get to next week so we can kind of compare some of the things that are going on. So let's just kind of make a chart here. Um, so we'll just start with the Word of God. And the Word of God is completed about 70 A.D. So that's, you know, a lot of history books will tell you it's 90 A.D. John lived to about 90 A.D. He wrote the book of Revelation, the last one, people think. We understand that the last author is Paul because Paul fulfilled the Word of God. And I believe those, those epistles of John and that book of Revelation are written earlier on uh, in, in John's ministry. And Paul is the final one. When, when Paul uh, lays down his pen, the Word of God is complete. Uh, he said his revelation is given to fulfill the Word of God. So it's Paul's epistles that complete the Word of God. Around 70 A.D. that happens. Um, in that early church, in that, that time when um, everything is very new, the dispensation of grace is new, Already at that point, um, the Word of God begins to be corrupted. That Word that has existed, we saw the last couple of weeks how it existed. You know, Moses wrote the, the, the words of the law in the book. The prophets added to that. Um, and that book has been added to and added to and added to. Paul had the Gospel of Luke because he quoted it 
in one of his epistles. So that book is being added to. There's a, a, a what we would call today the canon of Scripture is being built. Now, church history will tell you that the canon of Scripture wasn't decided until like 400 A.D. in the the the, um, the the Nicene Conference or you know whatever when all the Catholics got together and said this is the Word of God. That's really not what happened. God's people knew where God's Word was. It's being identified. It's one of the well, we'll get a verse on that in a minute. It's one of the responsibilities of the New Testament prophets. The, that gift of prophet in the early church is identifying this is God's word. Um, but early in the church, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So what do we know already is happening as Paul is writing the second epistle to the Corinthians? What do we know is happening? And he knows it's happening. People are corrupting the Word of God. So people are already corrupting it, changing it, adding to it. You know, the book of Revelation says if you add to the words of this book or take away from the words of this book, you'll add the curses of the book and all that. So, so you're not supposed to add, you're not supposed to take away. Paul tells us there are already people in his day that are doing that. If you go over to 2 Thessalonians, Paul indicates that again, 2 Thessalonians um, and chapter 1, uh, 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. What do we know from that verse? You be not shaken by, by, uh, by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as if the day of Christ is at hand. It's a counterfeit. No, people, people are saying letter as from us. So they're sending a letter as if it was from Paul. So if you send a letter that is as from Paul, then that means there are letters floating around that people are saying, hey, this, this letter's from Paul. Look what Paul had to say. Look what Paul said here. Look what Paul said there. And Paul says, that's not me. So one of the roles, if you go back to 1 Corinthians and chapter 14, one of the roles of the prophet in the early church was to identify what the Word of God was. A prophet receives the Word of God, therefore a prophet can identify this is the Word of God. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapter <coughs> excuse me 14 verse 37 if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him acknowledge that the things that i write unto you are the commandments of the lord if you if you think you're a real prophet the sign of a real prophet is they'll be able to acknowledge and understand the true word of god the things that paul wrote so so in that early church there is already a corruption of god's word going on there's already a process going on to identify those corrupt manuscripts, identify those corrupt letters as from Paul, identify those letters that have things taken out or added in, and, and, and suppress them and get copies of the true word out there. So we talked about last week, I think, or the week before, how that copies of God's word or the way he intended it to be distributed. Um, Moses took the, 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 the words that he wrote, he put them in the Ark of the Covenant, but then what happens from them there? The people were to copy them, wear them on frontlets before their, uh, in their forehead, copy them over their, their doorposts and on the lintels. Um, the king was to have a copy. The scribes in Israel, the, the whole tribe of Levi, the scribes in the tribe of Levi, their whole job is to copy God's word and get it into the end of the people. We saw that in every synagogue in the book of Acts, there is a copy of God's word. Jesus Christ stands up in a synagogue in Nazareth and reads from a copy of God's word. And those copies of God's word are the way it's preserved. There's two ways to preserve something. One way is you preserve the original and don't let anybody touch that original. The other way is that you get multiplied copies of the original. And, and getting multiplied, if, if, you, if you want to destroy God's word and there's only one authoritative, actual God's word original, how many do you have to destroy to destroy God's word? Just one. If you want to destroy God's word and there are literally millions of copies that are authoritative of that original, now how many do you have to destroy? You have to destroy millions of them. And that's, that's why God's design 
is to preserve his work in a sin-cursed world, in a world where men are going to try to corrupt that word and destroy that word. God's design is to preserve it through multiplied copies, not through preserving an original. The other thing is, if we had, if we had, let's say we had the original Ten Commandments on tables of stone, written by the finger of God, what would man do with those? Yep, we'd be, it'd be twenty dollars to see the original Ten Commandments. Come on down. So that's what man does. He makes idols out of things like that. People, you can still go online today and buy a piece of the cross, right? You know, hey, been selling pieces of the cross for two thousand years, and they're still got pieces of the cross. It must be pretty small by now, but they're still selling that stuff. So the original is not the issue, and we saw that as we studied along in this. So, so copies begin to be made of God's word, and there, there's there are basically two lines develop. Um, and you know this is extraordinarily abbreviated. I am not an expert on this. Um, don't go out. You're not going to be an expert after we do this. But there's lots of research out there. If you want to look at it, read it, understand it, you can you can dive into it as much as you want. Um, but this is just a very brief summary of what happens. There's the the the, the text of of the church of God's people. It's generally called, you'll see this word a lot of times, Byzantine text. And it's the majority. Basically, just think of it that way. It's the majority text. It's the one there's the most of because it's being, you know, all those churches that Paul planted, and he writes all those epistles to those churches. When they get those epistles, what do they do with them? They copy them and send them to other churches. And they copy them and send them to other churches. Because if you live in Galatia and you didn't get the epistle to the Ephesians, do you want to know what Paul said to the Ephesians? Sure. And if you want to know, if you live in Colossae and you want to know what he said to the Corinthians, you got to get a copy of 1 Corinthians. So these, these get copied, they get distributed, they get passed around. But also, there are, there are corruptions. So, uh, corrupt, corrupt, corrupt. Yeah, there we go. Is that corrupt? Yeah, yeah. corrupt. They're corrupt. And they get passed around, but the church does not accept them, and so they become very much the minority. There's not as many of them around, because when you get one that's a corruption, and those early church prophets are saying, that's a corruption, that's a corruption, we don't want to listen to that, then they're you know, oftentimes destroyed, they're discarded, they're not used, and so they become a minority text. This, these two lines of text go on through history, from the, the first century on through, and you get into the 1500s, and in 1516, there's a man named Erasmus. Now, remember, we're all, we're all in Greek here. All right, We're talking primarily today about the New Testament. So we're all in Greek. This is all happening in Greek. These things are being copied. The Greek is being copied and passed around. And in 1516, a man named Erasmus. Now, these names, if you read history about the translation of the text and, and the, the, the uh, transmission of the text, you'll see these names. Desiderius Erasmus. Desiderius Erasmus um, collected Greek manuscripts and he put together and published for the first time. And the word published is an important word. What does the word published mean? Printed. So if he published it, what had to exist? A printing press. And so when Gutenberg invented the printing press, it changed everything. And all this time of history from 70 AD to the 1500s, people are hand copying these manuscripts and distributing them. In 1516, Desiderius Erasmus was able to collect manuscripts from this line, from the majority line, and publish them and that radically changed everything because he, he got he got the the word of God now not just can we make one copy at a time but we can make hundreds thousands you know printing as it is today millions of copies all all you know easily and get them out into the hands of the people in 1582 
something. So Erasmus did this in 1516. It begins to have an impact on the people. It begins to have an impact on scholarly people because Greek is the language of scholarship in that day. They understand it. They can read it. They're going to begin translating it. We're going to see that in a few minutes here. And then uh, there's a reaction to that. In 1582, the, the Catholic Church formed a group called the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are formed, so what's happening, when, when Erasmus does this, publishes this, and about the same time, Martin Luther uh, does a, a, a German Bible, and so the Reformation begins. And people begin to actually read the Bible because there begins to be translations made, and we'll see that here as we go along. When Erasmus does this in 1562, then in, in the early 1500s, people begin to translate this Bible into English. And that's a real problem because where had the Word of God been up to that time? What common man had the Word of God? No common man had the Word of God. It's all for the, the scholars. It's all for the, the priests and the prelates of the church. And so in, in when, when it begins to get out into the hands of the people, um, then and, and the first one that happens, Erasmus does this in 1516. In 1525, the first published English Bible comes. Well, one of the first published English Bibles, William Tyndale. We'll talk about that in a minute more. The Roman Catholic Church didn't like that. They formed the Jesuits, and they took these corrupt manuscripts, and they translated the Bible from them. And as they translated the Bible from them, there, there begins to be a second version, if you will, of the Scriptures. The one that the church had accepted here, the one that was corrupted, began to be corrupted in Paul's day down here, the majority, the minority. Um, it, it basically continues this way. We're going we're gonna to pick this out in a minute and go through it more. But in, in 1611, we know what happens. The King James Bible is translated. And from 1611 on through, this basically exists only in the Catholic Church. But in 1870, uh, let's put 1870 here. 1870, 1881, there's a committee meets. It's called the Revision Committee. That Revision Committee met to revise the King James Bible. But when they revised the King James Bible, they took this set of Greek manuscripts up here and replaced it with this set down here. And the first Bible they produced was the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, from which comes the ASV, the American Standard Version, comes from, from which comes most of the new Bibles. 99% of the new Bibles come from this line of text down here. Meanwhile, the King James line stays pretty much unbroken. It is what you have today. The version you have today of the 1611 was actually published probably in 1769. Uh, it updated to Roman type. It, it got rid of, you know, it, like if you look at an original King James Bible, the, the F's are S's and stuff like that. So it updated the text, updated the, the font type, I should say, not the text. Um, so 1769 is the one you have today. But there's basically these two sets. There is this set of manuscripts that lead to the King James Bible and goes on till today. There is a set of manuscripts that leads to the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, and then the New Revised Standard Version, and the New American Standard Version, and the NIV, and the, the ESV, and the BULL, and everything else. So they all come from this. And, and the point, the, the reason that that's important is that there are, there are thousands of Bibles out there that you can buy, but there's really only two, two versions of the Bible. There's the version that comes from these majority texts, and there's the version that comes from these minority texts. That's the only two. Now next week, next couple weeks maybe, we'll look at the difference between those two text types, and, and some of what this guy pointed out in the first uh, session, the first study on that video, deals with that, where he talked about how you know, it's only in the, the King James Version that this, these numbers add up to 153. In, in this version, it's 152. In this version, it's 150. That's the difference between this majority text and this minority text. Now, so 
Let's forget all that. Don't forget it. Just erase it. And then we're going to go specifically when in 1516, Desiderius Erasmus published a Greek New Testament. And that was important because now it's published. Now it's on a printing press. Now it can be distributed. Now it can be discussed. Now it can be worked on. And, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But it would, would not be right to talk about this without mentioning the date 1384. Now, this is before publishing. It's before it's in print. Who knows the first man that, that translated the entire Bible into English? John Wycliffe or Wycliffe, depending on how you pronounce it, from which Wycliffe Bible Translators comes. He translated it all, um, and understand in this, in this time period that we're talking about, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, it is, it is not, it's not just 1600s, but it's punishable by death to take the Word of God and put it into the language of the people. John Wycliffe was so hated by the Catholic Church that years after he died, they dug up his bones and burned them to ashes and threw them in the river just so that they could get, you know, because they were so mad at him. So Wycliffe did it first, but the thing is, Wycliffe did it, he did it in, and, and there, are, there are people called, if you want to study this, it's very interesting, called the Lollards, that, that would take Tyndale's Bibles and make copies of, of Tyndale's Bibles and take them out among the people. They got uh, punished, for, what did I say? Tyndale, I'm sorry, Wycliffe's Bible, take them out among the people, um, distributed among the people, but they're all being hand copied, which obviously is a laborious thing to do, especially when you're trying to do it by, you know, candlelight and, you know, in a cold, dark stone castle building and all that kind of stuff. So it, it was a difficult process. But a, as time goes on, in 1525, so this is Wycliffe, and he is the first man to translate the entire Bible into English. In 1525, another man named William Tyndale comes along. And what's the significance of 1525? What happened between here and here in 1516? Desiderius Erasmus collated and published a Greek text. So now the Greek text is out there. And Tyndale um, is one of the men begins to translate it. Um, it's the first English Bible to be printed on a printing press. He was the first Protestant martyr. He was killed by Papus for his translation work. His translation was based on Erasmus's Greek text and Luther's German Bible. Remember, I said that Luther had translated the Bible into German, because Luther is German, of course. And Tyndale used that German translation and the Greek text that Erasmus had published in 1516, and he produced a Bible. Um, he did his translation work in Germany, and for all his trouble, in 1536, he was burned at the stake because he had put the Word of God into the English language. It's interesting as we go through this progression here that, and the reason to go through this progression is to understand that as we get to our King James Bible, it's not that, you know, history is just rolling along and all of a sudden King James gets a bunch of guys together and says, let's translate a Bible. That's not what happened. It's a process that's going on. It's a process that's happening in history. It's a process of the recovering of truth, the recovering of God's Word, the, the, the duplication and multiplication of God's Word, getting that under the hands of the people, which fuels the Reformation. And as the Reformation goes more, more people want God's Word. You know, Tyndale is the one that famously said to a, a church prelate in England, uh, if the Lord spared me, I shall make the boy that drives the plow in England know more of the Word of God than thee. That was his goal. That was his desire to get the Word of God in the hands of the people. And in your King James Bible, you see words that William Tyndale translated that are preserved in your King James Bible. For example, in Tyndale's Bible, he coined the term long-suffering. Paul talks about the, the, the Lord being long-suffering and abundant, and, and, and Moses does too in the book of Exodus, abundant in goodness and truth. That term long-suffering, Tyndale translated the Hebrew and the Greek that way. 
Um, the word Jehovah is first found in Tyndale's Bible. Passover is found in Tyndale's Bible. The, the verse in Hebrews that says Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, that's Tyndale. So those, those, those translations that Tyndale did as it went through progressive editions and progressive revisions were considered to be so exact and so precise and so perfect that they stayed. So in 1525, um, this, this is in, in Geneva is where this Bible was, was printed because at that point it couldn't be printed in England. Um, so, so Tyndale does it first. In 1535, and I know this is a lot of history, Keith's better at history than me, but too bad you got me this morning. Um, and and uh, as I said, th certainly we're not all going to go out of here and be experts on this, but just to give you an idea of the flow of things and how the Bible got to you today. Miles Coverdale in 1535 did a new edition, a new translation. He used Luther Luther's German Bible and Tyndale's translation, and he basically revised Tyndale's uh, Bible. <coughs> You'll hear it called the Bugs Bible because Psalm 91 5 in fact go to Psalm 91 5 let's just turn there just to give you some verses to look at instead of let's listen to my scratchy voice all morning uh, Psalm 91 5 why is is Coverdale's Bible called the Bugs Bible Psalm 91 5 thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day in Coverdale's Bible, it says, Thou shall not be afraid for the bugs by night. Um, so it's called the Bugs Bible because that's the way he translated it. Now, obviously, that's one that didn't survive uh, as the revisions went on, but that's, it's called the Bugs Bible. But some that did survive as time went on, uh, the phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, that's in Coverdale's Bible. And you go to, you know, you memorize the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That was Miles Coverdale that first translated that verse that way. As, as future translators looked at it, they said, yep, that's, that's the way to say it. And, and on it went. The morning star, the brighted morning star, referring to Jesus Christ. That's, that's Coverdale. Um, loving kindness, it was first done by Coverdale. Um, so he, he, um, he continued the process that Tyndale started. Um, there is, in 1539, it's called the Great Bible, G-R-E-A-T. It's called the Great Bible because it was big. Um, it was translated by Coverdale. It's a revision that Coverdale did of his own work out of the original Hebrew and Greek. It was 16 and a half inches by 11 inches, which is why it's called the Great Bible. And it's just, as I said, a revision of of Coverdale's first work, the Great Bible. Now, between 1553 and 1558, that's an important time in history, there's no translating work done in England because a wicked woman came to power. Isn't that always the way it is? A wicked woman came to power. And the wicked woman that came to power was uh, Mary of Tudor, who was known as Bloody Mary, because she martyred many believers and put an end to Bible printing. She just said, no more, that's it, no more Bible printing. And so for a time in England, there were no new English translations. There were no revisions of what was going on. But then, as this began to come to an end, 1557, there's a guy named William Whittingham. And William Whittingham, he used Bees's Greek text, which is another, you know, uh, uh, Erasmus. Beza is another early collator of Greek manuscripts and publishing those Greek manuscripts, getting them out in the hands of the people. He used Bees's Greek text and Matthew's Bible. So again, going back to these these Bibles, that it's a progression. Of Bible translations and revisions of those translations. He followed a 1551 Greek text for numbers on the verses. So this is the first Bible in English that has 
verses. Why is that important? Easier to find what you're looking for. Bibles with verses and chapter divisions are made to study. Because if I had to stand up here and say, okay, you know, turn to the book of Isaiah, uh, go in about eight pages, and then go halfway down on the page and look, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. But if I can say Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, yeah, okay, that's pretty easy. So, so the division of Scripture into chapters and verses was for the purpose of making it easier to study, making it easier to preach, making it easier for people to understand. So those, those chapters and verses are important. Um, the chapters and verses are not inspired. It, God didn't inspire, you know, make the chapter break here, make the verse break here. Although, as the man we saw in the, the video this morning pointed out, God knew where those breaks were going to be when he wrote it. So, you know, it's interesting to talk about because sometimes people will say, well, look, this is in this verse and that's significant because of the number of the verse. So, you have to be careful with that, but, you know, it's something to think about anyhow. Um, in 1560, there's a Bible printed. And remember, I've used the word printed. Also, the word that you'll see is published. Published means it's printed. All of these are on a printing press being mass produced for the people. So there's a book published in 1560. John Calvin actually wrote the prologue to this edition. Um, it's based on the Great Bible, uh, Bees' Greek text, and Miles Coverdale. It's sometimes called the Britches Bible. So if you go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, uh, it's called the Britches Bible because of the way it was translated. Um, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Well, in the Geneva Bible, they made themselves britches. So it's the Britches Bible. So, you know, and, you know it's an illustration words are being changed they're being refined it's being perfected as we go along um, riches became aprons bugs at night became terror at night things like that but there are also things that survive and come the whole way through this Bible is the Bible that your pilgrim forefathers would have used when they came to this country it would have been the Geneva Bible that they that they basically used and studied from and preached from um, in um, so from 1560 here to 1644 there are 140 editions of God's Word that is translations printed published put out for the people that people can read that people can understand so it's a it's just a it's a mass infusion of God's Word into the English-speaking world. And what else is true of English at that point? At, at this time in history, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> how big is the British Empire? It's huge, and it's growing. And the British Empire, you know, people leave the British Empire and come to North America and found the United States of America ultimately. And so the Word of God, because it's being translated into English, and because of the influence of the British Empire, it literally goes around the world. And there, there becomes a need in 1603, so that's within this time frame here. So let's, let's go back here. So remember, all of these previous ones are basically the work of single men, sometimes the work of men that are literally being hunted down. Um, Tyndale, you know, they're chasing him out the door as he's, you know, gathering up his, his manuscripts. So 1603, King James I of Scotland um, assumes the throne and becomes James I of England. And he is presented with a petition in 1604. It's called the Millennial Petition. 1,000 Puritan ministers go to the king and they have all these things that they want done. One of the things they want done is that they would like a, a new, because remember, between those dates, 1560 and 1644, there's 140 editions of God's Word go out. 
almost like it was today. Well, which of these is authoritative? And the Puritans go to the king and say, we need an authoritative, authorized version. And the king grants their request. He didn't grant all the requests, but that's one of the requests that he granted. And he decided we're going to do, we're going to take all these additions, all these things that are out there, and we're going to do an, a version authorized by the king that will be authoritative. Now, um, you can spend your whole life <laughs> studying the King James translators. There were 54 of them initially appointed, 54 King James translators. By the time they actually got, 54 were, oh, why did I write 55? Whoa, there were 54. See, your, your hand doesn't always do what your mind says. Um, by the time they actually got the work started because of, you know, some people withdrew, I got to do this, I got to do that, I died, whatever, there were 47, 47 King James translators. And they worked at the, the three major universities in England. Um, they worked at Westminster, they worked at Oxford, and they worked at Cambridge. And they, they over the course of seven years, from 1604 to 1611, they translated, they took all of, the, all of those English Bibles that had been done before, they took the, the, the Greek uh, text and, and the, the Masoretic Hebrew text that was available and was that time in print, and they brought it all together, and they produced the King James Bible. Um, each group was given, you know, there was a group at Westminster, at Cambridge, and at Oxford. Each group was given, you, you do, you know, Genesis to 1 Kings. You do 2 Kings to whatever. And each group did a portion of Scripture. Then after they got those done, they passed that around to all the other groups and said, you tell me what you think. You make your input into this. Then after all that was done, they had a committee of representatives from each of those groups to which they submitted that, and that committee went over them, and they looked at all of it. In addition, the king made a decree in England that said anybody who has any information or any opinion on any disputed passage, I command you to make that information available to these committees so that anybody in England that had an opinion was supposed to let these guys know so they would understand. And in 1611, of course, the King James Bible was translated. And it is, you know, there, there, is, there are revisions as far as Roman type, spelling of words, standardizing all of that, but the basic translation work was done in 1611. The version you have today, most of you, was published, it was first published in 1769. Um, by that time, English had become standardized. Roman type, font type had become standardized and it's something that you can read. If you try to read an actual 1611 King James Bible, it's a little tough just because the way the letters are formed and uh, it, it's just hard to read. It's not, our, it's not a type style that we're used to seeing and understanding. So what's the point of all that? So the King James Bible in 1611 is a result of that majority line of text that we looked at. Everything else, for the most part, we'll talk about a couple that aren't, for the most part, everything that comes after that is from the minority text, from the text of the uh, the text of the Roman Catholic Church, the text of the Jesuits, the text of there are two men's names you'll hear, Westcott and Hort. They were big on the revision committee of 1870, 1870 to 1881, and they worked on you know let's use this other manuscript, let's use these minority manuscripts. You say, well, is there that much difference? The video we watched earlier this morning kind of showed you know, how those differences can mean something. The next couple of weeks we'll look at some differences. And these differences in you know, the King James Bible versus the New Bibles, for the most part, some of them are translation issues, but for the most part they're textual issues. There's a Greek text here and there's a Greek text here. The word exists here, it doesn't exist here. Or it does exist here and it doesn't, I forgot what I said. Anyhow, they're different. They're different. Words are added, words are taken away and that becomes important. And next week we'll look at some of those just to kind of demonstrate why is it that we use the King James Bible? Why is it that we feel it's the Word of God? Why is it that we feel it's the authoritative standard? Why is it we feel that it's superior to others um, that you might be able to read today? 
and we'll, we'll get into that some next week, but I wanted to today, and if you want to know all the detail about what I just talked about, see Keith, because he knows all the detail of it. He can tell you all about these guys, what they did, how they did it, where they did it, when they did it. Um, and it's good, good for your study, good to understand. Just go research some of these people. Re re research Wycliffe and research Tyndale and research Miles Coverdale and John Rogers and men like that that um, got us to where we are today. Research the King James translators, 47 brilliant men that could read, write, and speak Greek and Hebrew as well as you can read, write, and speak English better than we can read, write, and speak English. They, they, they thought in Greek and they thought in Hebrew and they produced a, a very excellent translation of God's Word. So we'll talk about this more next week, but that's your history lesson. I won't do it again, I promise. Um, that's your history lesson for, for life uh, here, all right? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together. And as we've done so, we pray that the things said and done are brought honor and glory in the name of Christ and helped us understand how we got the Bible that we have today and why it is the word of God. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.